Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Before I get this video started off, there's a few little announcements I need to address because I've been seeing the same thing over and over. So we'll go ahead and get started with those. For those that don't want to hear the intro or any of this information, the timestamps are down below so you can go ahead and skip ahead and listen to the verse story. Number one, if the audio is of low volume and you're having issues hearing it on specific videos, that just means that the outside noise or if it's thunder and lightning or especially if they're still fooling with the house that I was talking about next door to me, it's really loud. So it's also really painful, shall I say, <laughs> to sit here and edit my audio to make sure all that background noise is gone. Because if not, yes, I can put the rain on it, but... All you're going to hear is my voice and a bunch of crap that you don't want to hear outside. So I'm doing the best with that. And I've actually got newer plugins and whatnot to help diminish that noise. So I hope that answers that question there. Number two, comments not getting answered. First and foremost, the, the members of uh, Back to Ashes, they get priority um, comments back. That's what they pay their monthly fees for. Um, and two, I'm a one man show here. And I do eventually get around to answering everyone as soon as possible. If there's a heart that I leave on a comment, just a heart, please know that I have seen and read it. And I really do appreciate all of the love and support. It's not me ignoring you. Um, just like today, I went through nine pages of comments. That gets to be <laughs> that gets to be a little overwhelming, but I do do it because that's what I love to do. And lastly, People copying a fit in the comment section and leaving nasty comments or trying to, I guess, rowdy up everybody. Um, that's not going to be tolerated anymore. <laughs> Please remember, I am human. I make mistakes and I also have a life that also keeps me busy and I'm doing the best that I can. Of course, narrating is my passion. So don't take this as me lashing out at anyone because I'm not. I just wanted to address these three things because I've been seeing it over the past month. I just haven't said anything about it and I've been trying to work on it. So you all, I'm extremely sorry if Back to Ashes is becoming trash, so I've heard, or if it's okay and you still love it. As I said, I'm not directing this towards anyone. I just wanted you all to know from my point of view, because there's a lot of people that comment and realize, well, some people actually think I'm a robot, but no, there's a human on the other side of this microphone. And I do my best not to, you know, let all that negativity get to me because I'm a very positive and upbeat person. With that being said, I'm going to shut up because I get too long winded and I really hope this helps. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Just remember to be respectful. I know I said it would be three, but I'm sorry, I forgot something else. Number four, that's the last one. If you happen to hear a story in my narrations that you've already heard before, that is because every narrator that narrates sleep or any other thing on their channels, we all don't communicate. And most of us use the same source to get our stories from. So yes, you might hear something you've heard before, but remember, every narrator tells it differently. I hope this helps a little bit. Cool? All right. Thank you all. For those of you that are new here, if you enjoy what you are hearing, please hit the subscribe button. And also, don't forget the bell and set it to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which happens to be daily. If you are wondering how to become a member of Back to Ashes or would like to tip me with a cup of coffee, all that information can be found down below in the description. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Stalker Stories. Right after this intro, an ad will play. I'll read the first story an ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. An ex-boyfriend stalked me in the mid to late 90s. He'd show up to places I went and make sure I saw him, but never approached me. 
He lived in a town an hour away, so there was no legitimate reason for me to keep running into him while going about my daily life. It was deliberate stalking. Since he never made threats and was always on public property, there wasn't anything I could do about it except ignore him and hope he didn't escalate. I eventually discovered how he always knew where I was. He had been cheating on me with one of my best friends, and after I broke up with him, she continued to cheat on her husband with him. My ex would use my friend to find out where I would be. While making small talk, my friend and I would talk about our plans for the day, weekend, etc., and she'd report back to my ex. It made me much more private and disconnected with my friends. It was a very serious betrayal on multiple levels, and I never shook the feeling of being preyed upon. I have been told not to talk in detail about this. It isn't advice coming from my husband or I. It is coming from people who were paid good money to catch the people responsible for this. I heard my husband say something the other day which stuck with me. He didn't know I could hear him. He was talking to someone we knew and ran into who asked how things were going with all of this. In case you weren't aware, this has been going on for months now and has required us to take major changes in our daily life. It has affected all members of my family. I prefer not to talk about my own mental health online. It is something I prefer to keep quiet most days and focus on myself. I have been struggling with anxiety and depression due to all of this, and I would be lying if I said I was the only one in my family feeling this way. My husband said something along the lines of, She's the one person I know who doesn't get scared about anything, and this is terrifying her. That sums up how I've been feeling. I'm scared. I am scared every single day. I am scared for the safety and well-being of my kids, who I don't like to even leave alone anymore. My older kids want to be able to be independent on their own, yet we have to be with them or have someone we trust with them at all times. Even trips to the gym for my son is a bigger deal than it would normally be. My kids can't even walk the dog alone anymore. That is how serious this is. They can't even go outside to play without an adult being with them. We have to keep windows and blinds shut at all times. My husband was right. I don't get scared often, but when the lives of my kids are being threatened, I am terrified. I can't talk about what has been happening recently yet. Every single time something happens, I just want to quit. It makes me want to just shut down, which is what we have had to do in the past. I like being able to go to work. I like being able to spend time with people outside my house, and I definitely like to be able to post things here on Quora. But at the end of the day, I am a mother and I am a wife. I will shut my business down, stop posting online, and isolate my family if that is what needs to be done. I want to be able to go outside and feed my damn chickens without being a nervous wreck. I want to be able to actually get good sleep and not wake up and walk through my house several times every night to make sure all the doors are shut and locked and all of my children are safe and okay. That is just part of how I am feeling. I hate all of this and I just want it to end. Just want to clarify, we have law enforcement involved in this. I honestly don't know how much I'm allowed to say, but a federal agency is involved. Most people can probably guess correctly what that three-letter agency is. My husband and I have hired a private security team. They're the ones with my kids whenever they leave the house. Even if my husband and I are with our kids, we have security follow us for extra safety. It isn't a just-in-case measure. We've been advised to hire them from law enforcement. 
We are constantly on the phone with law enforcement, having meetings and having them at our house on a weekly basis. It's exhausting. It's terrifying. And hiring guards is expensive as hell. There has been some progress, but things like this don't get resolved within a day or two. I used to do this for a living, so I know the process. You have to build the case before making an arrest as you have one chance to try a suspect in court. We want these people caught and put away so they can't harm my family or anyone else anymore. It's clear these people aren't in the right mindset as well. They've got law enforcement after them and still aren't afraid to continue threatening and stalking my family and going to extreme measures. Once caught, there's going to be a lengthy legal battle. Fortunately, I'm working with a wonderful legal team that has offered their expertise throughout this entire process. I am very grateful for anyone who works to handle this situation. There is a lot I can't share for privacy reasons. Once this is completely over, I may share the entire full story. I can't share it and risk the safety of my family or do anything to weaken law enforcement's case against these people. I know the people behind this are reading this post. I'm guessing within two hours of posting this update, they'll be calling me, threatening me, and probably saying they'll never, ever get caught. Oh yeah, you will. I hope law enforcement catches you because they'll be far nicer than my husband or I will ever be. Okay, yes, I have been stalked by a girl. She was in my class in engineering. She was a typical first bencher who always studied hard, spoke less, introvert, liked by all lecturers and students. Everyone had a high regard for her. Whereas I was a last bencher, quite naughty in class, extrovert and friendly with people, yet I am very good at studies and very much focused on my goals in life. I had made my mind up to become an IAS, Indian Administrative Service, officer, when I was at school and made contact efforts like reading the Hindu newspaper daily, making notes of NCERT textbooks, studying prescribed books, etc., to achieve my goal right from class 11. Once in a class during our first year engineering, our lecturer asked each of us to tell about our goals. Since I was quite vocal and took pride in becoming a civil servant, I spoke at length about my goal of becoming an IAS officer. Unfortunately for me, she too had the same goal. I had never spoken to her in person. I just knew that she was a typical first bencher who studied all too well. In third year of engineering, some of my friends and I started a club for science enthusiasts in college and were looking for members who were interested in joining the club. Then, a mutual friend, who was a fellow founder of the club, spoke to me about getting her into this club. Without giving much thought about it, I agreed since she was good at her studies. This led me to know her, though I had never noticed her much. Being in the same club gave a chance to interact, and I got to know that she was an IAS aspirant, too. I used to give her tips on how to study for the same. There was a limit of my interaction with her. I thought of her as a very dedicated student and a good friend. That's about it. Never did I try to go any extra mile with her. I had my own last ventures group with whom I used to hang out always, both guys and girls. Never told her or involved her with any of my personal stuff or things that would make her feel like I was interested in her, like chatting for long hours or going to movies or typical dating stuff. My interaction with her was limited to discussion about our club, IAS things, and friendly conversation. It was our last day at college. 
She came near my room and gifted me and edited, swapped my face with movie stars who had played roles of an IAS officer in the movie. Photo frame. I thought it was a great gift, though badly edited, and thanked her for it and went back to my room and took my afternoon nap. When I woke up, I was in for some shock. I had received 60 plus WhatsApp messages from her number. She had narrated how she had a crush on me from the initial days of college and how her liking for me increased when she got to know about our common goals. Everything was described in intricate detail. Anecdotes about various incidents. I thought it was great for her to remember things in detail, but I made it very clear that I have no such interest in her, and she was a good friend. In fact, I thought of her as a sister. She always gave that sisterly vibe, like never bunking class, always sitting and first bent listening to the lecture intently. I did not tell her then that I thought of her as a sister because I thought it would be rude on my party part to say that to someone who had confessed her big crush. Moreover, I liked some other girl. I didn't think it was necessary for her to know that. I just had to convey that I was not interested in her, and I did. Then started stalking days. Within a week after I completed my engineering, I had to join to my work in a different city. This made things worse. She used to ping me every now and then in WhatsApp, inquiring me about every single detail, like if I had my lunch or not. She told me that she doesn't feel like eating until and unless she knows that I had already had my food. Thought it might look nice on the onset. I felt it was very immature and started ignoring her texts. Is it only me or do others too feel suffocated when someone who you are not intimate with starts texting you so much? Her messages increased exponentially with every passing day. Though I told her very clearly I was not interested in her. She kept on messaging me saying that she too is doing that as a friend but this incessant texting made me irritated. I had to concentrate both on my work and my dream of becoming an IAS officer. In addition to this, her constant pestering made me feel like it's a nuisance. Failing to make her understand that I don't like such constant messaging, I blocked her on WhatsApp. Thinking about getting blocked will give her a clear signal of me not liking her and will make her stop messaging me. Meanwhile, I hadn't told any of my friends about her pestering me. I thought it would spoil her good girl image. But things took an ugly turn from there. She started obsessing on me and started mailing me on my email ID since I had blocked her on WhatsApp. Some people from her hostel, people whom I don't even know, also started mailing me that why was I doing this to her? Those emails used to be very lengthy, describing how I'm hurting her by ignoring her. I took pity and unblocked her on WhatsApp, but this time I made it very clear that I not only don't have any interest in her, but I also thought of her as a sister Believe me, Indian guys just don't call a random girl a sister. They do mean it. She agreed and started adding the suffix brother to every sentence she texted. This continued for one week and then again things started being the same. She not only told me that she cannot think of ever calling me a brother, but she also proposed me for marriage and would send her father to my house to convince my parents to agree. Once I had achieved my goals, that's it, I thought. Things had gone too far. I had to put an end to all of this. I told her sternly that things are taking a wrong turn here. I don't want you messaging me and disturbing me, and wanted to be left alone. 
I blocked her again. This did not stop her, though. This is where it started feeling like emotional atiater, emotional harassment, to me. She started calling me from different numbers and texting me from those numbers. Till now, I have blocked more than 20 different numbers of hers. She had texted me from her parents' number, friend's number, and had bought many SIM cards too. Some of her friends, whom I don't know personally, texted me that I was being very cruel to her and should unblock her and listen to her once. Once I unblock her, I used to get the same old, do you really not like me? I'll send my parents to your house to talk about marriage. No matter how much I told her that I don't like her and things did not change. All of this was excruciatingly painful for me, emotionally. I thought I had enough of this and started informing some of our mutual friends about it. They initially denied it, telling that a good girl of her stature can never do anything. I had to show them the screenshots as proof. Only then did they start believing me. They too started convincing her to leave me alone. But it was all in vain. I unblocked her several times again, convinced by her friends that she had moved on and would not stalk me anymore. But in the end, it would again come down to, do you really not like me? I had had enough. I would give her chances to reform her ways, then end up getting abused, how stone-hearted I am how insensible I am, etc., etc. This constant mental abuse had a toll on me. Some of the effects were, number one, I started fearing girls, especially introverted girls. One cannot say what they are thinking inside their mind. Though I know all girls are not the same, I find it very difficult to talk to a girl openly now. Number two, my studies started deteriorating. I gave IAS prelims exam once and failed. I could not come to terms with it for a while. I had worked so hard for this class since 11th grade. Number three, I was in acute distress, constant abusing by WhatsApp texts, calls, SMS, emails, and lobbying through mutual friends had made me very depressed. Number four, with depression came insomnia. I found it hard to sleep at night. I was always thinking if all those things she had told me while abusing me, were they all true? There was a constant inner fight within me. If what I was doing was right or not, should I give up resisting her and just accept which was opposing to my inner feelings? Number five, my self-confidence hit the greatest low of all. An IAS aspirant is supposed to be very confident, but in my case, things were taking exact opposite turns. I lost my faith in myself. Number six, I started speaking to psychiatrists online through various apps asking to help me with all of this emotional abuse. I was scared to go meet them directly because going to a psychiatrist is still a stigma in India. Number seven, when her abuse and harassment reach new levels, I even thought of going to the police to complain along with the mutual friends with all of the evidence. I researched online, a man cannot complain against a woman for stalking him. No section in Indian Peril Code makes this a crime, but vice versa is a punishable crime. This made me absolutely helpless. Number eight, I started staying aloof. I no longer derive pleasure in doing things which I used to enjoy earlier. I started avoiding social gatherings. I started being an introvert. I kept in touch with only a bunch of close friends. Number nine, I started fearing calls from unknown numbers, thinking that it was her from some unknown number just to irritate me again.
I still don't pick calls up from unknown numbers if the name of the caller is not displayed on a true caller. Number 10. Meanwhile, I had left my job after a year and three months to prepare for IAS exam exclusively. My failure in first attempt had disappointed my parents and my brother. I had no courage to tell my parents about this incident. I feared they would feel that their obedient son failed to achieve his dreams for some small problem caused by a stupid girl. Believe me, it was not so small of a problem for me. 11. When I shared this entire story with some of my close friends, they started saying that I was a lucky guy that a girl herself was stalking me, when the normalcy is for a guy to stalk a girl. They made fun of me for it. They all took it as a joke without realizing how disturbing it was for me mentally and emotionally. There were some positives that I can take out from this entire episode, which lasted for more than two years. Number one, I started to have much more and great respect towards girls who get stalked by guys. Now I know what they actually go through. A little stalking might be okay with anyone, but when it reaches a level that one starts feeling abused, it's not okay at all. Number two, I always thought of me as not so emotional. This whole episode brought out a different side of me. I now know who exactly I am and what exactly to do and what I need from life. And more clearly, what or whom I don't need. Number three, since I had been a victim of depression for almost two years, I now can empathize with people and family who are suffering from depression. I make a special effort to talk to my friends who are going through depression. I support them saying it's just like some other disease and one should go talk to a doctor. I make sure that they never ever feel lonely. Number four, I realize that not all silent and decent looking girls are actually good and not all outgoing and extroverted guys are bad. I don't judge people quickly now. Number five, recently I shared this whole episode with my brother who asked me, what is it with me and not picking calls from unknown numbers? He was very supportive and told me that I did a good thing by sharing this episode to him and some of my friends. He told me that it's good that I keep some of my friends informed about these developments. Number six, there is a dire need for making some of Indian laws gender neutral. I have nothing against feminists or I'm not a misogynist. I only believe laws should protect everyone equally. When laws are gender neutral, only then can they bring harmony in society. I still get messages even after blocking, SMS will be received and I get a notification named message from blocked contact from her that she has moved on and that I should forgive her and soon be normal to her again. I have forgiven her, but I don't think I'll make a same mistake of trusting her again and start being friends again. I just don't need it. I still get abusive messages that I am hurting and stuff. I just tell her to fuck off. And yes, I used it, which translates to get lost only after two and a half years of her drama and to leave me alone. I just do not care. I felt it was necessary for me to share this because stalking is not okay at all, be it a girl or a guy who undergoes it. When cross the limit, it has the capacity to disrupt your life. I request you all not to stalk anyone ever. Oh yeah, P.S. I'm giving my second attempt of IAS this June of 2018. Please wish me the best and keep me in your thoughts and prayers.
I did have a few guys stalking me, but there was this one guy who stalked me for the longest period of time, especially from 2004 to 2015. It all started when I was in school. He was my friend's cousin's friend, who belonged to a different school. And he somehow got my friend's phone book stolen and found my landline number. For those that don't know, a landline is actually a phone that has a line attached to it, and you can't take it with you like a cell phone. <laughs> I just wanted to put that in there for, <laughs> for um, laughter's sake. Cool. All right, let's get back to the story. I have very busy working parents. There used to be no one at home when I used to get in from school. My landline started to ring irrationally and then go silent before I reached the phone. I felt that someone was doing it on purpose as the same continued for hours. The same happened for the next consecutive weeks. And one thing that I had observed is my phone never rang like that after 6 p.m. That was when my parents used to get back home. Later, the phone started ringing for long. When received, the other person wouldn't utter a word at all, no matter how long I hold it and then disconnect it. This was a loop now. I somehow got my father to replace the ordinary phone with the one which had the caller ID associated with it, without saying anything about why I was wanting this done and what was happening in their absence. Next day, when the call came, it did come with the calling number. Once the call went off, I called it back. He received and suddenly disconnected. I called back again. I heard someone on the other end. When asked, the person told me that it was a public phone booth and there were two guys inside the booth before. First two days there were no calls. Third day, again, the phone rang and heard someone say, Hello? Uh, who is this? Akashta, I love you and disconnected it soon after saying that. I was scared. I was terribly scared. I didn't want that call to come again. I was small then, maybe in my seventh, I guess. I was scared how my parents would react to it. I thought, what if they feel I was really loving someone when I was not? I was still thinking all of this, and suddenly... I heard the phone ring again. Hello? Hello. My name is M. I'm sorry for disconnecting. I'm getting scared. I don't know what to say. Don't do this. Don't call me again. I'm not interested or in love with you and all those related things. You can take time to decide, but there's no saying no. And you are looking pretty in this red dress. That's when the call disconnected again. For a week, there was no phone call from him. I was having a bit stressed few days. One day after my school assembly, we were headed back to class. I heard my principal announce, I want Akashta P and RG, a girl, to wait for me in my cabin. We were on our way. I thought there could be some competition or something that she wanted to talk about, as we both belong to the same dance crew of our school. I'm sorry, but I'm not responsible. Uh, what's wrong? There's a guy following you for many days. His name is M, and he is my cousin's friend. They hit XYZ, a boy, of our class yesterday. Wait, what? But why? I accidentally told him where your address was and that he was just teasing you, I'd hoped. But I didn't know it would turn to this big mess. XYZ saw my cousin, too. R's cousin, PJ, was our classmate from three years ago and then changed the school. But that's why he might have complained to ma'am. And he has also got your number from my brother, P., we were waiting there outside of the cabin. XYZ was already there. 
As soon as she got in, she called us inside. What is this, Akashta? I don't know anything, ma'am. I, I didn't even know that this all had happened. I heard her say, turning towards R, it to me now. Uh, someone is calling me and pestering daily. I, I haven't told anything in my home yet for two reasons. First, I don't want them to worry about me, and secondly, I don't know how my parents are going to take it. I started crying as I was saying about all of this for the first time to someone, after keeping everything suppressed so long. She further took details from my friend R about their schools and complained it to be the police. She did shout for me for suffering alone, and also made two of my classmates boys, of course, dropped me off home safely on their way every day after school. She did support me a lot emotionally. Oops, I'm sorry I forgot to tell you this. One day, he did appear before me. He told me his feelings for me. He told me he'll not let me be with any other guy's love. He warned me that I shouldn't get too close to guys. He told his friends that they will be watching me and he gets every update about mine. Now, I'll tell you how were my days after this incident in 2015. Number one, every single day I used to get a call to my landline, same voice, same words. The moment I used to go home, the first I did was mute the ring. Number two, no matter where I go, temple, market, movies, dinner with my family or friends, he used to be there before my presence. Number three, my younger brother and younger cousin's brothers used to be threatened by him to bring the chocolates and gifts to the house, which he used to buy for me. Number four, he did come and create a mess in my class during my 10th board exam. I don't want to detail it. Number five, school was over. I joined college. Every day he used to be at my bus stop and take the same bus, follow me until I got in, and then leave once I enter campus. Number six, no matter what time my classes end, he was the first person to be seen in my college bus stop, take the same bus, and walk right behind me until I reached home, sometimes talk to me and walk closely. Number seven, I got myself a new cell phone, used to keep it hidden and never took it out. Once he heard my cell ring when he was right beside me close to my college gate and told me, I know that you are using your phone from the past two weeks. I know you haven't given your number to your school friend yet. It's better if you keep it to yourself, else I'll have to make friends from your new class too. I started walking fast. He caught my hand on the road and came forward to grab my cell phone. I pushed him and ran inside the college gate, skipped the first lecture, went to an empty class and called my auntie crying and told her everything. Number eight, my uncle found him somehow. My aunt knew about him as I told her before and also the boy and my aunt's neighbor was his friend and warned him. Number nine, the very next evening, my cell phone showed me his number. I knew his hand phone number from the landline's caller ID. I didn't receive it, for which I received a text later which read, I will call your landline phone if you don't pick this one up. I was scared of the matter getting revealed to my parents like that. I received it. He told me, the more you bring me these moments, the more it makes me try harder for you. I just love you and loving something isn't a crime. Ask your uncle to be more polite to me. If we meet next time, say that that's not the way to treat his future son-in-law. I cried all night. I didn't sleep at all. That was my very first time making the Black Knight turn white. 
Number 10. My cousins also had grown up now. They did not fear for him. My first cousin was in his seventh. He once went to a nearby bookstore to get something. He saw M standing with his friend there and heard him say to his friend that no matter how hard this sister makes it get complicated, I'm not going to leave her. In the end, I'll even kidnap her if the need be, but she's the one that I'm going to marry. He told this story deliberately so that my brother gets back home and tells this to me. My brother got angry and hit him. His friend hit my brother. He then hit his friend for hitting my brother. My poor brother did not say anything to me at first. It was M who told me that before my brother ever did. Number 11. I guess it was in my first year diploma. The one of my male friends had come along with me, saying that he has got some work close to my bus stop. We got down, and I talked to him, asking where this shop was that he was going to. I helped him find it as it was on my way back home. The moment I reached home, I got a call from my friend saying, I was sitting in the bus stop and waiting for my bus. There came a guy in Red Pulsar and asked who I was to you. I told him that we were just friends and he told me I shouldn't be seen in this place again. Who's he? Number 12. I then had certain situation where I fell in love with a boy who was my senior too. I had feelings for this person after he proposed to me, but I don't want to give in for many other reasons and 50% of that is because of him. Number 13, I gradually started feeling more for him and confessed my feelings too, but had not told anything about him to my boyfriend. I wouldn't go out with him. I would fear meeting him outside the campus, no matter what I sacrifice. I just wanted to keep my boyfriend safe. Number 14. M once came to my college. It was during lunch. Seeing him in the corridor, I thought he got to know about my relationship. I was badly scared and was sweating like a whore in a church house. And then... I saw my boyfriend and him came before each other. He did not see my boyfriend. I immediately had a sigh of relief, thinking that he was not here for him. He did talk to a few guys. I got to know that he and friends in my college too. I felt that he was searching me. My boyfriend had been to lunch. I didn't go out that day. I sat in my classroom. I thought enough of being coward and decided to face him. Number 15. I called him myself, told him I wanted to speak with him, told him not to love me, told him that my parents would be hurt knowing this. M was a goon, actually. I told him how having him always behind me and around in general irritated me. I cried a lot on the phone that day. He told me he was just loving me and needed me. I told him that I can never have feelings for him. He asked whether I was loving someone else. I said no. I somehow wanted to put an end to him so that he wouldn't reach to my other guy. Number 16. I then changed my number. I told this to my parents. My parents somehow got M's parents involved and sorted the case. My mother was very upset with me for hiding it for all those years. But back in my naive, even now when I go out with my boyfriend, I would still feel uncomfortable. I wouldn't touch my guy when I used to sit on his bike. I used to tie stole to my face and sometime we went out. I always kept my guy away from me. I used to turn him off when I wouldn't meet him in specific areas and restaurants. 
But I'm happy that I took a good step before someone coming to my guy and asking him to stay away. I love him so much. I can never see him in any of these bad situations just because of me. 17. Even now when I go out to my naive, M comes near my house at least once. If he sees me somewhere outside, he takes one more turn on his bike, but that doesn't irritate me now as he had stopped irritating me. 18. He is finally married to someone now. I just pray that he takes good care of his wife. That was the worst experience I have ever faced. All right, you all, this one's a long story. Yes, my ex became my stalker for three years. It was hell. Pure fucking hell. Stalker laws were not yet on the books, so I had to deal with him the best I could. Thank God I was a state employee. That meant the state police could get involved, and boy did they. They were almost like bodyguards. They were terrific. They would walk me to and from my car. They would come into the office to check on me at least once a day. They were great guys, so protective, but they couldn't follow me home. I was alone with two babies at home. This all started when my ex filed for a divorce. We were separated, and I no longer cared about the marriage. It was dysfunctional and abusive. 25 years wasted except for my children. However, he thought surely I would contest the divorce. I didn't. I just signed the papers and sent them back to the court. I wanted no child support, no alimony, nothing. I have a good job and don't really need his money. I just wanted him gone. When he found out I did not contest the divorce, all hell broke loose. His plan to scare me into submission did not work. He was outdone this time, and he was fit to be tied. He would call me at least 50 times a day with threats of violence, even at work. He called my boss and lied. He tried to get me fired. He called my co-workers and harassed them. I was humiliated. He came to my job and was caught letting the air out of my tires. He called my family. He alienated my children. He had my check garnished by telling the county that he was the custodial parent. Without checking with me or checking with their school records, they just started deducting half of my paycheck for child support. I had to take a day off work and travel 60 miles to straighten out the mess he had made. He, finally, called my pastor to cry on his shoulder. He was looking for allies. He couldn't find any. Finally, he broke in my house one night and tortured me for six hours. My whole face was swollen, black and blue. After he beat me, he fell asleep, trying to choke me to death. He was so drunk. After he fell asleep, I slowly slipped out of the bed and called the police. He was awakened with a mace in the face. Boy, did he scream. They took pictures of my face and hauled him off to jail because by that time, I had a restraining order. So, he went to jail that night, but he bonded out a few days later. They called me to let me know he was out. I was so nervous because he left his car at my house, which meant he had to come back to get it. I stayed up all night waiting for him to come and get in his car. I didn't know what he would do next. He finally came walking up at about 1.30 a.m. I never saw him move so fast. He wanted to get out of there fast. I was relieved, but that was just the beginning. The calls and threats kept coming even though I had a restraining order, so I began taping them. Next, he started driving by my house. 
Once, I went to stay with my mom because I was just so frightened and exhausted. I was just about to close her front door when I saw his van drive by. I became hysterical. I called 911. I told them he's stalking me at my mother's house. They said that they were on the way, but he left. I went to stay with a friend that night. I didn't feel safe even at my mom's. I didn't want him to see my car there and break in the house or her mom. She's a frail widow. I didn't sleep that night. I had two babies with me. It was miserable. I felt so bad for them. One night, I went to an outdoor concert with a friend. It was a family concert, so I had my kids with me. I was just getting relaxed when I looked up and saw his van coming around the corner. I was terrified. I thought, My kids. Where's my kids? There were a bunch of kids playing in the grass nearby. I saw my little one, but my daughter was missing. She was eight years old. I started calling to her. By this time, he was out of his van and calling my kids to get into his car. Drunk again. My neighbor came running when she heard his voice. I said, let's go. But once he shouted for them to get into his car, they obeyed. That's what they were used to. I couldn't blame them. I didn't have a cell phone then. I ran to the nearest phone booth and called 911. I told them he had kidnapped my kids. I was screaming into the phone. Everybody at the concert looked up. I didn't care. I had to get my kids back. Meanwhile, he pulls off with my kids driving drunk. I raced to my mom's to see if he dropped them there. They weren't there. I called the police again. They had Bolo out for his van. I sat up all night. I couldn't sleep. I was so scared for my babies. He was out of his mind and unpredictable. I prayed all night. The next morning was Saturday. My heroes, the state police, called me to tell me his van was now at his house. They were waiting all night to see if he came home. And he finally did, with the kids. They looked fine. They were going to get my kids, and I needed to be there. My heart was racing. I jumped in my car and drove the 60 miles in half the normal time. When I got there, they had his house surrounded. They said that he knew he was there because he answered the phone. They had a bullhorn. They were commanding him to send the children out first. They asked me if he had a gun. I wasn't sure. He never had one when we lived together. He wouldn't respond. He sat there about an hour. They kept calling his phone, but he did not answer. Finally, he opened the door and said the kids weren't there. They told him to come out and put his hands up. He did. They handcuffed him and asked if anybody else was in the house. He said no. They asked where the children were, and he said he did not know. They went in. The kids were not there. They kept asking, where are the kids? We saw you go in with them. He finally told them they were with his brother in another city, 50 miles away. They asked, how did they get to that uncle's house? He flatly said, he came to pick them up. They asked when, he said about an hour ago. I was undone. I thought about how did this happen right under our noses. Then I remembered the back door leads to a major street. He let his brother take them out of the back door while we were still waiting in front. They took him to jail again. I had to travel another 50 miles to get my kids. I called his brother to give him a few choice words. No answer. I thought they probably haven't arrived yet. That's another long story for another day. At any rate, 
I didn't see my kids until late that night. I was so relieved and thankful to God that they were not hurt or dead. And so were they. On the way home, they said he was taking them to Arkansas but had no money for gas. I thought, thank you, Jesus. There's a lot more, but this is getting too lengthy. In the end, he was finally arrested and charged for terroristic threats, the tape I had made, assault with a deadly weapon, he tried to ram my car into heavy traffic, and vandalism, my car tire. He was facing 15 years in prison. He made a plea deal and got probation. He never bothered me again. Thank you, Lord. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true stalker stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Cindy Cleveland, Patty's niece, Samantha Place, Kwame Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Chrissy Elias, Denise S., Tina Mead, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, Anita V., Doba Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Amy Klimko, and Sugared Spite. Thank each and every last one of you for being the pillar on which Back to Ashes stands. I cannot say it enough. And thank you to the other subscribers or just random listeners. Thank you so much for showing support to Back to Ashes. Not only does it help me, but it also allows me to continue to provide the vocal melatonin that everyone likes. And if it weren't for you all, I would not have a voice. So... Thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.